You're now listening to the Laravel Podcast. Everybody, welcome back to the Laravel Podcast Season 6. I believe it's Episode 9, but at this point, it's just all magic numbers that other people take care of for me. I am one of your hosts, Matt Stauffer, and Taylor, you want to say hi? Hey, everybody. It's Taylor Otwell here. Taylor Otwell back in the studio. So we've got a lot of conference things to talk about today. We've got a couple tweets that went out. Um, but before we talk about those, I want to talk about the fact that you recently announced that you're going to be hiring a position for, head, I think, Head of Engineering or VP of Engineering at Laravel. And I feel like the just the ripples went out through the world. Every single time you hire somebody at Laravel, ripples go out. I mean, like, you know, the first time you hired, the idea to be an employee of Laravel was such a big deal. Um, and sometimes you put out job positions or sometimes you just said, hey, you know, I went through the networks and, you know, hired somebody. But I feel like this is one of the most formal and structured ones that you put out. Um, so mm-hmm. I just wanted to, like, kind of check in with you about, and, like, let's say somebody hasn't seen the job position or, or even if they have, like, can you talk a little bit about what you imagine the relationship between you and a head of engineering looks like? What are you really looking for in this role? And in, in what ways are they going to be taking over for pieces of what you do or working underneath you? Just what does Laravel look like with the head of engineering, right? Because I think the world thinks of Taylor as the head of engineering of Laravel. But obviously, when you grow, you got to delegate things. So can you talk about that a little right. bit? Yeah, so you're right. A lot of the hiring I've done in the past has been sort of internal, behind the scenes, picking people out of the open source community that I thought would be a good fit. Yeah, This is definitely our most formal job posting we've ever made. And it really comes down to the fact that we would like to scale the dev team at Laravel. Right now we have about eight or nine developers uh, full-time. Some are more full-time than others. like, mm-hmm. And others work you know, three to four days a week. But we would like to get to somewhere, let's say, around... 20 devs um, and possibly a couple infrastructure people Um, mainly because not not for no reason but because we have some ambitious projects that we'd like to tackle in 2024 that will really be some of the most ambitious projects we've tackled to date and it's going to require more people so when you get more people you sort of potentially need um, people to manage those people and to lead those teams so I wear a lot of hats at Laravel right now. I'm I'm CEO, I'm CTO, I'm CPO. I I literally enter expenses into the yeah, books for you're accounting. CFO, you're COO, um, you're everything, man. Yeah, I manage Laracon, you know, I manage refunds on customer support. So I do a lot and um that works out okay right now. Even now like we probably could use like some sort of director of yeah. engineering. Um, but basically what this person will do is help us navigate scaling the company in that way. So lead some of our future hiring as we bring on more devs, formalize our onboarding process, uh, manage the teams day to day as far as yeah. making sure no one's roadblocked or that we're making sort of the right technical decisions, fielding questions from the developers on overall architecture or guidance and making sure it's aligned with what we want to build, you know, as a company, as well as, you know, as we grow the team, we could have sub teams working on responsible for certain segments of applications. So Mm -hmm. you could maybe imagine like, let's just say, for example, there's like a forge API team or a a forge um, deployment team and, and, and coordinating those teams so that they're working on towards the same direction, you know, takes yeah, effort and, yeah. and planning. So a lot of that. Um, and then, you know, a lot of behind the scenes stuff, like working with vendors as, you know, mm-hmm. as we work out partnerships with different vendors for different things, which we do okay, from time to time, navigating that so that it's taken off my plate so that I can focus on what I really love to do, which is steer our high level product direction, yeah. curate the open source framework, um, which I do every day and um, focus on those sorts of things and not necessarily like the day to day management of the individual dev teams. Yeah. So yes, if that sounds like something you're interested in, please apply. Um, yeah. You know, we're Make looking for someone. Notes. Yeah. We're looking for someone definitely with some management experience because this is actually the first mainly management position we have ever hired at Laravel yeah. previously, we've only hired either devs or customer support or whatever. Yeah. So I'm pumped, man, because I think the things that we want to work on are really exciting and I'm excited to get started. So Love it. there you go. Yeah. And I mean, for those who aren't kind of in conversation with you as often, I think it sometimes can be easy to forget the fact that Laravel is an open source framework and community and also a business and they're both named Laravel, right? But And you mm. are... You're do, you are over both. They're not necessarily the same thing in a lot of ways. And of course, they benefit each other. But like, 
Vapor, Forge, Envoy, all these things are, are paid products run by a company. And then there's also Laravel and Laracon. Well, I guess Laracon, yeah, Laracon kind of sits in between the two. And so thinking of VP of engineering, I think one of the first place some people's minds have gone is like, uh, is this a you know is this an open source thing? I was like, no, he's running the products, and so mm-hmm. it's cool that the idea that you having delegation and management beneath you in the product world actually it enables you to be more involved in the vision for the products and the direction for the products, but also more involved in the open source aspect if you want. Because if you're running a company, as I'm very intimately familiar, like the day to day work of running a company can often get very much in the way of the fun stuff that you want to do, like writing things and creating and making videos and writing code or whatever. So that makes a ton of sense. Um, so if anybody's interested, we will put a link in the show notes to the application. Obviously, if you're listening to this a month later, it'll already be out. But <laughs> if you listen if you listen live, you'll, you'll take a look at that. Okay. Um, so the next thing I had on our list is conferences. It feels like this is the season where all the <laughs> conferences are either happening or announcing that they're happening. And so I've got like a long list of what's going on, but I'm just going to start in order of what's going on. Laracon EU, I believe, is this weekend. I think by the time this comes out, it will actually already be happening, question mark? Um, yeah, Febu- February 5th and 6th, Monday and Tuesday of next week. Yeah, this week. will c- probably come out in the middle of Lara. It'll probably come out Tuesday. So basically, if you're hearing this and you just came out, Lara- Lara- or Laracon U is probably wrapping up. I want to talk about that in a second. And then you also started putting out some announcements for Laracon US, which is the summer, and there's three other Laravel conferences. But let's start with Laracon EU. You're going there. You, I assume you got a pretty decent amount of the core team because a lot of them are in the US, or in, in the EU. What's your thinking? What's your plan? Are you just going to hang out? Are you got some big announcements lined up? You know, any, any other notes you want to share about kind of what you're looking forward to at EU? Yeah, we definitely have things that are coming out at EU, multiple announcements coming out at EU, actually, um, which I'm really excited about. Um, you know, we've got some Laravel herd related announcements, uh, which by the time this comes out will probably be public. Um, we've got a new package coming out at Laracon EU, and I'm going to spend a lot of time going over Laravel 11 at Laracon EU, which we're hoping to release the first week of March. Um, so we're about a month away from that. Um, so I'm going to cover a lot of stuff. I've actually been, you know, pretty much heads down um, so far this week working on my talk and making sure it's all polished up and. Uh, I'm excited to show everyone everything like usual, and I think it's going to be an exciting time, and um, you know, there's going to be some cool stuff coming out. I love it. Um, I have a channel in my Slack where I uh, keep up with uh, my research assistants for the book on everything that's happening that we need to update the book for. And mm. so every single time something comes out with Laravel 11, even if I don't get to dive into it, I kind of like grab the link or grab the note and kind of like throw it in that channel. So I just, yeah. uh, Anna Lijba, who is my um, current person who's helped me out, I was just like, tentative release date, March 11th. <laughs> Make sure you watch Taylor's <laughs> talk. I, I don't yeah. even know if she's going to Lair- Laracon EU, but I'll tell her she needs to anyway. So that's cool. So uh, package update to, to Herd, Laravel 11 stuff. Um, Mm -hmm. you know, that's a lot going on considering how many other conferences you're going to be involved in. Um, so you're definitely gonna be at EU. You're going to be at us. Are you going to, you're not going to the lives this year, right? Not, not going to UK or Denmark. I'm not, I I won't be at Denmark. I won't be at Denmark because, uh, it's literally just a few days before Laracon us, the Laravel Uh, live, uh, UK. I'm not sure it's possible. I I haven't, I haven't firmly decided there. Um, so yeah, I could make an appearance at one of those. It's possible. What about India? We'll see. I'm not going to be at India this year. Um, yeah, it's just like during our spring break here in the United States. Oh, yeah. So I'll probably be with the family like on vacation, unfortunately, because it looks, yeah. that's always a fun that's time. Amazing. Jeez. Yeah. Um, well, we'll talk about um, all the rest of those. And well, I guess let's talk about Laracon India just real quick before we got talk about Laracon US. So Laracon India is February 25th and 26th. So it's coming up pretty soon as well. Um, I tend to assume that the people who are coming from outside of India are usually, you know, speakers and the people who are coming from inside of India already know about it and already going to it. But if if Mm. there's some reason you're somewhere who's near India in any way, shape or form and who hasn't heard of it, just go to laracon.in and watch the videos from previous years. Like, (laughs) it looks like the most amazing freaking party ever. I was so sure I was going this year and then decided to, you know, up and get married and that kind of threw off my plans a little bit. But next year, we're going to be there. Yeah, yeah, it is a crazy time for sure. They're very passionate about Laravel at Laracon India. I love that. 
Um, okay, so let's talk about Laracon US. So you have announced mm -hmm. some of the details um, in terms of the dates and the times and also speaker lineup. So can for those who don't follow you on Twitter and who have not been on top of all that, can you talk a little bit about when and where it's going to be, but also a uh, surprise outside of the Laravel <laughs> industry uh, speaker announcement? Yeah, so Laracon US is August 27th and 28th in Dallas, Texas this year in the Deep Ellum neighborhood of Dallas, which is kind of a hip, hip vibey part of Dallas right now with some cool restaurants and bars and stuff, music venues. And um, so that's where the conference will be. It's about a month later than usual. Um, but uh, other than that, I think it will be an awesome time. And we have so far, myself speaking, Caleb Porzio, the creator of Livewire, and this sort of um, you know outsider new speaker this year, or a new to the Laravel world, is uh, Primogen, who is, I guess you would say, developer, educator, yeah. um, advocate, slash entertainer, yes. uh, journalist, commentator, you know. Uh, yeah, developer personality online, um, both on Twitter and on Twitch. And, you know, funny guy, charismatic, energetic guy that, uh, you know, shares all sorts of development opinions and, and commentary. And, um, his talk is actually going to be really cool. I think it's going to be sort of a lightning talk, 15 to 20 minute talk about how to be an excellent developer, like committing yourself Love to it. development excellence, basically. Uh, Primogen works at Netflix, I think, for his day job. Um, um, so yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I've, I've never actually met him in person, but he seems to be a popular guy online and a funny guy. And, uh, you know, I think I always try to bring in over the years, we've always brought in some sort of like new faces that are not yeah. traditionally part of the Laravel crowd, whether that's uncle Bob or, uh, you know, Ryan holiday, the author of daily stoic or, um, <laughs> We've had Jason Freed from Basecamp do a Q and A. So we, we've always brought in sort of interesting people to these conferences sometimes, and I think I'm glad to sort of resurrect that tradition this year with Laracon US. Yeah, I love that. Um, and we talked about it about the you know the venue and stuff like that a little bit on previous episodes. But I am still very excited because every single time I talk to anybody. Um, who knows the area? They're like, oh, deep. Oh, I mean, there's there's all these this and that and the other. So it sounds like it's like a neighborhood. Like, and you keep naming the neighborhood, and it's very clearly for a reason because it sounds like there's like a there is an excitement about that specific neighborhood. Whereas mm -hmm. sometimes it's sort of like, oh, the city's cool. But it, like, if someone's like, oh, you're going to that city, and then they're like, oh, deep Elm. I'm like, all right. So I'm like starting to really get excited about kind of what's there and what we're all going to experience and everything. Yeah, yeah, it's a cool spot, and the venue is called the Factory. I think it's traditionally more like a concert venue. Um, mm, okay, very, just just like the the venue we were at in Nashville this year was also that way. It's it's traditionally yeah. used for concerts. So it's a similar kind of venue. It's a little bit larger, so we have more room and can accommodate more people. It has like a balcony and a mezzanine and stuff. Um, yeah, and even like VIP lounges, as you may see on the website. So yes. it's, it's oh, a pretty I'm so cool spot. <laughs> I'm so ready. I love it. Okay, so that is U.S. So Laravel Live UK. I don't remember. So I last went there in 2018, and I don't. For a lot of these conferences, it's hard for me to remember who paused at various moments and versus didn't pause. But it is definitely back. At, it kind of feels like it maybe has a little bit more of the Laravel core team and leadership than the last couple of years. And there's just something about it. Like, and the designs look great. And I'm just like, I feel like they're stepping up their game a little bit this year. So I don't know if you've experienced that, but they announced it. it's going to be 18th and 19th. 18th of June in London. Um, so they've yeah. so far announced speakers. It's Eric Barnes, and I'm also going to be there as well. I'm super, super excited to be be back. And Joe Dixon and James Brooks from the Laravel team are going to be, um, you know, helping organize things. I don't actually know anything else beyond that. I don't know what's going to be anything else. I mean, do you know any other details? I really don't. You know, I mean, I, I know what's happening, but this is sort of all of the Laravel live conferences, for those not kind of in the know, are more community led conferences. So we have Laracons, which are sort of these big flagship events, almost by mm -hmm. continent, you might say. So we have one in yeah. North America, one in Europe, one in Asia with Laracon India, and one in Australia. Yeah. Um, so they're almost like continent-wide events, whereas the Laravel Lives are a little bit more localized, let's say like per country events mm -hmm. with uh, Laravel Live UK and then Laravel Live Denmark. Um, more geared for the local audiences, a little bit smaller audiences, but UK is like a big... You know, tons of Laravel developers in the UK, so I'm sure they'll have a really good turnout for that event. And uh, yeah, I'm excited to see it go well. And you know, I'm always glad when people throw these events. It's, it's good for the community. Yeah. 
Um, I've just looked up the the venue for Laravel Live UK, and it is, if not where it was last when I went, it's at least right in the same area. It's right next to the British Library, but for Harry Potter nerds, it's also right next to um, I don't know the name of the station, King's Cross Station, but they've got one of those little like platform nine and three quarters things where you can kind of walk into it. Oh, nice. So, um, great. So that's Laravel Live UK, and then Laravel Live Denmark. Um, I haven't caught up with it because I know I'm not going to be able to make it. But you said mm-hmm. it's so it must be sometime in August. Yeah, it's 23rd, in August. Yeah, twenty second, twenty third in Copenhagen. Yep. Do you know who's organizing it? I do. It's a guy named Casper. Okay. Um, I you know I I don't know if we've met in person, but he reached out to me some time ago. I mean, this was seven or eight months ago at least. And you know, hey, ask if it was cool if he organizes a Laravel Live in Denmark and. Uh, you know, I said, go for it. Um, well, yeah, I asked him, you know, like, how big do you want it to be? And, and where do you think you'll have it? And all of that. And it all sounded good. So I just told him to go for it and give it a shot. And uh, uh-huh. yeah, it seems like that's coming together as well. Oh, yeah. And they've got Freak is going to speak. Peter from Tailwind is going to speak. Michelle Hansen, who's both from Geocodio and the Laro community, but also very prominent right now because she's doing a ton of advocacy for Section 174, which is this big tax law and uh, the US thing. So that's great. And I love uh, just looking at the websites for each of these conferences. I'm like, people are really taking branding seriously. Like they all <laughs> look so good. Like I just want to go to your conference because your branding is so good. Right. Yeah. All right. Yeah. They're, that is cool. Um, so Laracon AU, we know it's happening because um, Michael has been asking who should speak, but the website is still for the 2023. So we assume yeah. that there's going to be a Laracon Australia 2024. Everybody should keep your eyes open, but we don't have any dates or times on that. And I feel like that's it, right? Are there any other Laravel lives that you know about? I can't think of any right now. Okay. Um, that's all Don't I know of. Don't be offended if he's forgetting there's many <laughs> things he's got to be on top of. There's not, no other ones that I know about, so. Yeah. Cool. Well, that's it. So, yeah, so just very exciting opportunities for conferences. I know when conferences first started opening up, people were very nervous about what it looks like to throw conferences in the days of COVID. Um, but other than a few very notable, like, people looked backwards and said, you should have done your security better. There, I have not seen anybody with any security or serious health risks in any of the major conferences I know that have opened up. Um, you know, people are often uh, always trying to do things to make sure that people who need, you know, XYZ to feel safe from a COVID perspective are able to feel that way. But I've been to quite a few conferences over the last couple of years and have always felt safe and always come home, you know, healthy. So fingers <laughs> yeah. crossed, we keep just having that experience. But it's so, man, it is so nice to be back in person again. Like, yeah, so yeah, nice. yeah, agree. I like it. All right. So I got two tweets from you that I wanted to get the folks to listen to a little bit. So the first one was you announced uh, a new st- scout driver. Um, and for those who don't know, you know, could you talk a little bit about what is scout and then also what is type sense? If, um, and I, I personally don't even know what st- type sense is. So if somebody's never heard of scout, can you talk about what scout is and then also talk about type sense and why type sense? Yeah, so Laravel Scout is our first party package for making eloquent models full text searchable. So, you know, a classic use case for this for this would be something like a blog post model that um, you want people to be able to search your posts, like the the content of those posts, and you want to do it using a robust search engine that actually has like you know kind of fuzzy search and typo tolerance and things like this to make the search experience actually feel like a modern search experience should feel. Um, And Scout lets you do that in sort of this driver-based way, like many other Laravel features work uh, in this way. You know, the queue system supports Redis and database and whatever else, SQS. Uh, Likewise, Scout supports a few different search backends that you access through a unified API. So like, for example, in your Eloquent model, you would say post colon colon search and then your search string which could be to some arbitrary you know query of text and then get and it rec- it retrieves all of the models that match that search string by communicating with the search engine and then pulling the models so the drivers we had prior to type since being introduced were just algolia which is a commercial uh sort of closed source search offering then on the open source side, we have Miley Search, which is an open sourced offering similar to Algolia um, in the sense that it's, you know, kind of fuzzy matching and, 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 and works really well and is easy to configure. Um, we also have a database option, which sort of falls back to just like full text searching if that's yeah. what you want. So if you want to use it with like MySQL or Postgres, you can just slap that on there. So that's really great for smaller applications or if your needs aren't that heavy, you can just get started without any additional software. And then the newest member to this family is TypeSense, which has 
both an open source offering and then like a cloud hosted Mm -hmm. version of that open source offering. And Algolia, TypeSense, and Miley Search all have very similar goals of basically being the anti elastic search in some yeah. way. Like, you know, very easy to get up and running, very easy to configure and just start searching, which I think is what most people want to do. Elastic Search is like a very powerful piece of software that is more than just full text search, it, it has yeah. a lot of other features. Um, so these things are supposed to be much less configuration, much less startup cost and pain. So yeah, we we shipped uh, types and support. I think it was just last week and last week's Laravel release. So we now have a new driver on the block for Laravel Scout. So you can give that a shot. We've also already integrated that with Laravel Sail. So our Docker local deploy or local development um, option. We already had supports for Miley Search on Laravel Sail, but we also have support for TypeSense now as well. So if you create a new sale project, you can now select TypeSense as one of the services that your application will use, and it will be in a Docker container, you know, nice and isolated from the rest of your operating system. I love it. And I'm sitting here on the um, TypeSense website, and they have this really great breakdown of TypeSense versus Algolia versus Elasticsearch versus Miley Search. I'm like, well, obviously it's them, so it might be a little biased, yeah. but like, it's a pretty helpful breakdown, and it, it definitely is giving me some reasons to consider... You know, we've we've used Miley Search for a lot of people just because Algolia is pricey and Elasticsearch is miserable, right? So, like, we've right. often gotten people in Miley Search, but it has some limitations. Um, and I'm sitting here looking at TypeSense, and I'm like, oh, they're I think they're kind of aiming to be what Miley Search is, which is you can self-host it if you want, maybe a little bit more affordable than Algolia if you're using their SaaS. But also, it's got some of it's missing some of the downsides of Miley Search. Like, they've got it says query field weights and boosting, so you can say certain fields are more important than others, and mm. a few of the other things that have bothered us. So, um, this, no, and they, I'm noticing there's a few that it's pointing out things that they don't have that Algolia does. So it feels kind of fair. So I will I'm trying to sneeze. <laughs> Come on. Okay. So I will link that in the show notes. Um, and, uh, very cool. So I'm excited to try about, try it out. If we don't have a driver for, um, for takeout for, um, for type sense, I'll make sure we get one added. So nice. Yeah. Super simple. Yeah. I love it. Um, all right, I had one other thing I wanted to ask you about, which is the tweet you put out about Vapor. So you had this tweet where you basically said, I forget exactly the words, but basically like, this is the original, you know, one of the original incarnations of Vapor. And it was literally just black text on a white screen. <laughs> and it's so yeah. interesting because when you think Taylor Otwell, you think elegance and beautiful and fantastic APIs and stuff like that. So it's very interesting that I was, it felt like kind of a surprise to see you put something out that was just this like really ugly page. Oh, here you go. You said mm. early UI of Laravel Vapor as I was building it, April 2019. And it's literally Times New Roman, horizontal rules, default button styles. So one of the things yeah. I wanted to ask you about was like, as you're building something like that, obviously on day one, you don't always choose to build with the most beautiful thing. Although maybe that's different now that you know, you've got Tailwind everywhere. Um, but what do you normally build first? Do you build a UI and then start putting stuff into it? Do you build like a like a code module that does this action, this, this action, this action, and then later you're building a clickable version? Like what's your process like as you're building a software as a service? Um, so I used to always build the backend first without any UI. And that just started to bite me over the years um, yeah. because... As I started to build the UI, you know, the customer facing part of the application, I would see these obvious flaws like in the back end implementation. So now I almost always start with like the ugly UI that you see in that tweet. Um, yeah. And it, the UI doesn't have to be pretty at all, right? Like it doesn't have to be styled as long as you can put the right buttons and inputs and make sure the whole flow feels good from the customer's perspective because it can always be rebuilt and styled yeah. later, but it, it's enough to let you get the customer experience right and get the software right yeah. um, as you build the back end. Um, I just found that as I tried to build the, if I tried to build the entire back end and then come in later and strap on a front end, like maybe I built the back end using just like a CLI interface to interact with it, with artisan commands and stuff like that. Yeah. And I was going to try to bring in a UI later. I just always was such a pain because I missed. Yeah. I, or Some these flows in the back end, the API endpoints were either awkward or they weren't right based on how the front end was going to work and it just never worked out well. So I think it's a good idea to always kind of build them in conjunction. Like and uh, back when I was building that, you know, you mentioned Tailwind. Um, Tailwind was out, but I didn't know it yet. Mm-hmm. And so Adam basically paired with me and gave me a crash course as we walked through the Vapor nice. front end. This was in the early Tailwind days. Um, 
you know, to kind of help me learn Tailwind and also, I guess, to be a little bit of a proving ground for Tailwind, you know, with a real mm-hmm. project to see what it could do. Um, and that's actually how I learned Tailwind was kind of Adam awesome. walking me through it personally <laughs> as, as we built Laravel Vapor. Um, but yeah, with Tailwind, it's actually, you know, kind of easy to make some semi, semi-decent user interface without a lot of effort these days. So I'd probably just use that now. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny because that's I, I was like I do the Tailwind version of this when I'm building things, but the Tailwind version of this makes it look so good because you've got a wrapper, yeah. you've got a header, you've got a footer, you've got default font setup. So even this exact same HTML in a Tailwind page would have looked so much different that it's sort of like this feels very much a relic of a pre-Tailwind day, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hmm. Um, it's funny you mention that because I actually I learned Tailwind first by fighting fighting Adam and going on his podcast and saying utility CSS is the future, uh, which mm-hmm. I will always uh, not regret, but laugh at. <laughs> um, but then being very quickly converted as he was kind of like building early stages of pre-tail and stuff at Titan. And then I was just like, hey, can I steal this prototype from my website? And it was the same thing. I was just sort of like, try something, DM Adam, be like, it's not working. Try something, DM Adam. I don't know if I would say he's, I was a proving ground because they'd certainly built stuff that complex before, but man... Having to figure it out as you go, source diving, you know, having access to the source is a really fantastic way to learn something. Yeah. Um, okay, so I guess this is going to be a little bit shorter than usual. I thought the conference stuff was going to talk a little bit more, but I did have, as always, something fun at the end. So um, uh, Imani and I got this, um, she found it, all credit to her, this little map on the wall of our bedroom that has pins for where she's been, where I've been, where we've been together where we're going soon and then like our kind of dreams down the road. And um, of course it shows like that travel is really important to us. But one of the things that we were talking about as we were trying to decide where to honeymoon was like, we don't often get this amount of time away or like willingness for us to kind of spend money on travel. So what things can you do, especially, you know, when you, it's like a special moment versus just your average travel. And we realized that the length of time away, therefore like the, the amount of distance we were willing to travel, you know, like you're not always going to travel 24 hours somewhere when you got kids back home. Um, but also the, the, like what continents have we been to, you know, cause like we want to get to every country, you want to get to every continent or whatever. And so we're like, well, we can knock out an extra continent and go to a continent that, you know, Asia is pretty difficult for Americans to get to without it being like a big ordeal. So kind of mm-hmm. knocking those out. So for me, I guess the answer to my already question, you know, is sort of like, do you have any like big travel goals? Like I'd, by the time I die, I'd like to see XYZ or get to ABC. And I was like, the first one is we want to get to every continent. We'd like to get to every single country if possible. Um, we'll see how that works out. I mean, you got like North Korea and stuff like that. Um, <laughs> but I just wanted to see, like, do you have any kind of like travel, either goals or places you've been like, I've always wanted to get here and I've never been able to get here or something like that. Yeah. I mean, I share your goal of visiting every continent, um, yeah. which is a, definitely achievable. Um, yeah. The only ones I lack are um, Africa and Antarctica. Okay. Um, so it definitely feels achievable if I'm willing to like, what's the name of the ocean pass that you have to go through to get to Antarctica? I know what you mean. Um, it's notoriously rough seas, right? Um, I think it's called the Drake, the Drake pass or Drake channel or something like that. Um, so we'll see if I'm willing to stomach that for a few days. Um, so anyway, I mean, that's, that's an interesting goal. I, I don't know that I aspire to go to every country that, that feels like a high bar, but I salute your, <laughs> you know, I salute your um, ambition there. Um, we would actually, I would actually really like to go to Thailand, um, and but like you said, it is so dang far to yeah. get to these places. Um, I really enjoyed going to India, but again, so far. Yeah. Um, so you really do need a lot of time, and with kids, it is difficult. But uh, we'll see. You know, I would like to go around the world, like on yeah. one trip, sort of uh-huh. circumnavigate so, the entire yeah. world by stopping, you know, in Europe, in great. the middle, in the Middle East, in Asia, and then work my way back uh, yeah. in some in some route. Um, that would require a few weeks, obviously, to pull yeah. off. Uh, so we'll see. That that would be one goal I have. Yeah, I love that. And um, I remember going to Larikai AU was the longest travel I've ever done, um, and. I kept we were starting to plan India it didn't happen but yeah with Thailand so we're we leave at 7 p.m. from Atlanta we stop in Doha I think it's called which I, I assume is in yeah the, in UAE. Qatar it's Qatar yeah yeah um and we're there for a couple hours and then we arrive in Bangkok at 6 40 a.m. Uh, and I, so I think that makes it 20, that's not 20. Yeah. I think it's 24 hours of travel. Cause they're like 12 hours 
off from us. So about 24 hours mm-hmm. of travel or something like that. And I'm like, that's nuts. You know, like, so how, sp- go ahead. How far is your flight from Qatar to Thailand? I think it's six and a half hours. So I think it's okay, a 13 so and a half hour flight to Qatar and then a six and a half hour flight to Thailand. Yeah. So, so when I went to India, I connected through Doha. I actually stopped oh, in Doha for like two days and, oh, cool. and hung, hung out there for a couple of days. But that was a 16 hour flight from Dallas to Qatar. Yeah. yeah. One, one flight. Yeah. So apparently it landed to Qatar is only at 13 and a half hours. So sometimes there may be some mm. tricks to, to kind of yeah. break up the segments, you know? Um, yeah. But I'm I'm very excited about it. We're also doing something. We're in Thailand, where we're um, again. This is all the money. I can't take any credit for this. But we're going to Bangkok for a few days, and then we're going to Phuket, which is where like a lot of the beaches and resorts are mm-hmm. for a couple of days, and then back up to Bangkok. So the goal being like to get some city vibes and see temples and stuff like that, but also to get some you know very honeymoony like being in a resort yeah. at a beach kind of. And it's vibes, so. it's hot there right now, right? Yeah, it's ninety degrees. Uh, yeah, that's Fahrenheit, what I thought. Like every day, and I'm a big guy, and I'm like this. That's my biggest fear right now is just I'm gonna be just drenched in sweat the whole time so but what are you gonna do <laughs> no nah, it'll be went, worth it yeah went to the store the the thrift that thrift store but like a tj maxx or whatever and bought as many like very very thin you know linen shirts as i could and stuff like that i'm like well we'll figure it out so mm-hmm. the doha airport is really pretty sweet it's it really a nice is. airport okay. yeah nice. it's pretty cool we got I think and, like three hours there so yeah yeah it's a cool spot yeah um my friend just invited me last year, and I couldn't because of kids, but he, he's got a whole bunch of buddies who all wanted to go to every single continent, and so they all rented a... Um, not rented, but they, they bought the same tour to an Antarctica. It was about... I want to say it was a week to a week and a half, and mm-hmm. it involved like helicopter flights to this and all this kind of stuff, but they all... You know, every single one of them just kind of like booked the thing so that they had friends. So, because they were like, you, who wants to be in a boat literally by yeah. yourself for a week and a half or whatever? So, if you ever decide up go, going, um, <laughs> you know, like uh, send me a message and I'll give you that. But I'm hoping that the day when I get to the point, the next point where I have this much time away, uh, that probably will be the next place I go. And the, mm-hmm. honestly, the p- one of the funny stories here is one of the reasons we're able to do this long trip is because we planned our wedding date around my kids' winter break so that I'm like, mm. they're going to be with their mom for a full week so we know we have this extended period of time because otherwise it would have been like it's honeymoon shmoney moon you know you still got responsibilities to your kids so we're like no we are going to take a long freaking honeymoon it's going to be good so very yeah. grateful to my family for helping for a couple days prior to that so awesome sweet well um thanks for teaching us things hanging out um <laughs> everything as always um i'm going to disappear in my honeymoon for a couple weeks so everybody uh will be probably a week or two delayed on our next podcast episode after that and we'll have recaps from Larakani you we'll see if we can get some other folks to get us some notes on what Lair- laravel india um, happened we might be butting up on a laravel 11 release date at that point so we might have to walk through some of the big features as well there so yeah. there's a lot coming up in our next one yeah sounds good i'm excited okay well thanks taylor and thanks everybody else right. we'll see you all later see ya. bye